Our Old Testament reading for this morning comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, verses 1 through 15. God redeems Jerusalem. Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For the uncircumcised and the unclean shall no longer come to you. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise, sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose yourself from the bonds of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, You have sold yourselves for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, My people went down at first into Egypt to dwell there. Then the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now therefore what I have here, says the Lord, that my people are taken away for nothing, those who rule over them make them wail, says the Lord, and my name is blasphemed continually every day. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he who speaks. Behold, it is I. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings good tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Your watchmen shall lift up their voices. With their voices they shall sing together, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord brings back Zion. Break forth into joy. Sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart, depart, get out from here. Touch no unclean thing. Get out from the midst of her. Be clean you who bear the vessels of the Lord. For you shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and lifted high up, and he shall be extolled. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage were, was marred more than any other man and his form more than the sons of men. So he shall sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouth at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. And our other scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Luke. We'll be passing over the epistle lesson this morning. So Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 40. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of him. And then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, 
Behold, this child is destined for the rising and the fall of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. And she was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for the redemption of Jerusalem. And so when they had performed all these things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Here ends the reading. Thomas Jefferson is best recognized as being the third president of the United States and the author of the Declaration of Independence. He is also remembered for being our country's first ambassador to France. His legacy today lives on as he designed and dwelt in his famous home called Monticello. Now one aspect of Jefferson's life that is not as well known, although known by some, is that Jefferson created his own Bible. He didn't like the supernatural parts, and so he took his scissors and cut out all the miracles, but still kept all the moral teachings. Yet, despite taking his scissors to the Bible, he still believed in some type of higher power. And we know that because it is said that when Jefferson lay dying, on July 4th, 1826, that he spoke words that were barely audible because his body had become so weak as he was dying. And the words that he repeated a few times were nunc dimittis domine, nunc dimittis domine, which is Latin, Latin for Lord, now let. And of course, we remember those words. They are the words that Simeon spoke as he beheld the child Jesus in his aged years. So who was Simeon in the New Testament? And as you might remember too, there is a Simeon of the Old Testament. Because so much of the Old Testament is simply recycled in the New Testament. You can't have the New Testament without having the Old Testament. People have tried to do that. Just like Jefferson tried to take the scissors to the Bible for all the miracles because he thought that couldn't happen, so a man named Marcion in the early church tried to cut out the Old Testament. He only wanted the good and loving God of the New Testament, not the stern and judgeful God of the Old Testament. Forgetting that there is much judgment in the New Testament. Remember the book of Revelation, after all. There is much love and comfort and hope and peace in the Old Testament as well. So we think of Simeon in the Old Testament. Simeon was one of the many sons of Jacob. He worked for his first wife for seven years, and as you might remember the story, he was tricked by his wife wearing a veil on their wedding day, and he had had too much to drink, and so he had to work another seven years to marry the woman he really wanted to marry, Rachel. Now, the Bible tells us that Jacob, Simeon's father, when he looked at Leah, it describes her as being a woman of weak eyes. A woman of weak eyes. And that's simply some type of uh, euphemism. It's a way for the Bible saying she wasn't very good looking. So he married Leah first. Then he married Rachel. And one of Leah's sons was Simeon. In the 34th chapter of Genesis, the scriptures recount a sad incident that just as Jacob had been tricked, so there were other misdeeds that were done in the family. Now Simeon's sister was named Dinah. She's the only one of the sisters named in their family, in the scriptures. And Dinah was raped by a man whose name was Shechem. And Shechem, even though he had violated this sister of Simeon's, he somehow grew to love her and, and even respect her and wanted to take her into his home to be his wife. Simeon's sister Dinah and also another brother named Levi, they decided we're going to seek revenge for what they had done to our sister. So as 
Shechem approached their family and said, I want to take Dinah to be my wife, to come live with me. And they came up with a plan. They devised a trick. They said, well, our people are circumcised people. You folks are not in Shechem, because it was a name and a place. Also, it was named after the person. And so they said, you become circumcised, and then you can become one of our kinfolk. And Shechem, was the man, was so willing to have this woman whom he had violated to be his wife that he convinced his fellow men to go along with the procedure. And you can imagine what a painful <laughs> thing such an operation at that age was. And so as the men of Shechem were recovering from their circumcision, then came Dinah's brothers, Simeon and Levi, and slaughtered the whole camp of the men because they were in pain and could not fight the way they normally would in their weakened state. We feel the anger. We understand the rage that Simeon of the Old Testament and Levi felt about their sister being so violated. And their father Jacob, we can only assume also, was greatly incensed. But Jacob knew the ramifications of what this was going to bring to them. And so he chastised his sons that now they had created even more enemies. Now there would not be peace, but it would only be war between their people. This negativity, this dysfunctionalism continued, and we read through this in the scriptures, that how Simeon and Levi became jealous of another one of their brothers. There were many brothers in this family because Jacob had many wives. There were four wives at least and many children. And the one who had become the favorite child of Jacob was Joseph. His brothers were jealous, as we remember from the book of Genesis, of how Jacob talked so big and how he dreamed that his brothers bowed down to him and that the stars bowed down to him and there were stalks of wheat that bowed down to his stalks of wheat in the fields. And so they made a plan again. They formed another conspiracy. And so one day they threw their brother Joseph down the well and were going to kill him, but their senses came to them in some respect. And again, instead of killing him, like they did for Shechem and his men, they decided to sell him into slavery. And where did he end up but Egypt? This seemed like it was a great misfortune for the people of Israel, the sons of Jacob. But in fact, it led to their deliverance. As we remember that there was a famine in the land years later. And Joseph's brothers, the ones who had deceived him, who had sold him into slavery, had almost killed him, came to him and asked for something to eat. And he provided them with plenty to eat and even invited them to come stay with him in Egypt. And so they dwelt in the land of Egypt for many years, and it was a blessing for a long period of time until they became enslaved in captivity. So here we have the story of the Old Testament figure of Simeon, and we see how his actions and the actions of his brothers led to many bad things. Still redeemable by God, but many bad things. Now we come to the New Testament, Simeon. An altogether different man. Now this Simeon, as we read this morning, was a just and devout man, as Luke chapter 2 tells us. An older gentleman who had exercised a long period of forbearance in waiting to see the consolation of Israel. Instead of being one to quickly react with a knee-jerk like the Simeon of the Old Testament, the Simeon of the New Testament was one who was patient. God had promised him that he would not die until he had seen the Messiah. And so Simeon greatly rejoiced when he finally beheld that holy child. And being ecstatic and having uh, fulfilled the joy and expectation of his life, he spoke those words that we remember again. Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. And we witness a similar example in the life of the prophetess Anna. Now it is clear from the text of scriptures that Anna was also not a young lady. Luke chapter 2 says that she was a widow of 84 years. Now some of you who are past 84 years in age into your 90s probably think, well, 84 doesn't sound so old after all. And you might be onto something because 
there is an ambiguity in this text. It says that she was a woman of 84 years, but it doesn't specifically state was she a widow who happened to be 84 years, or was she a widow for 84 years, and, but she had been married before that, and that was not including uh, her childhood and her seven years of marriage. Now that sounds like it would be a great number, and yes, it would be a long lifespan. But it makes sense that it could have been 84 because we remember in those days that the life expectancy was much shorter from all those who died in infancy, those who died of childhood diseases, those who were injured in farm work. They just did not have the technology that we enjoy in this day and an age. So 84 might have been still a, a very old age. But 106 would certainly still be possible. Now, perhaps you read in the Lakes Area Review uh, in the paper this week that the first woman to receive the coronavirus vaccine in the county is a woman named Harriet Lobbins, who is 106 years old. She made it through the first pandemic, and, <laughs> and now she has made it so far through the second. So it certainly can be the case. I remember that there was uh, two sisters, I was very young, but I remember my parents talking about this, who lived a few houses down from us, who uh, years and years later, the, uh, these two sisters, uh, their maternal grandmother and their paternal grandmother, so you know their mom's mother and their dad's mother, each lived to be 106 years old. So it can happen. There is such a thing. Former uh, presidential candidate John McCain, when he passed away, remember that from cancer a few years ago, his mother at the funeral in her wheelchair by uh, the casket was 106 years old. And she happened to die now, now this past year, just a few months ago in October, at the age of 108 years old. So it certainly is possible because the scripture text here seems to emphasize that she was of a very uh, extended age. And so we think of these two senior citizens, how they waited their whole lives and how their lives were fulfilled. This was the apex of their existence to see the Christ child. Simeon had been preparing for this, and Anna the same. Now we tend to think of this Christmas story and the Christmas story in general as being a story of something new. You know, after all, when Jesus' birth comes in Luke chapter 2, it's at the beginning of scriptures. It's the ushering of a new age, and certainly it is. But Simeon and Anna were like John the Baptist. And while they are present in the New Testament, they really come from the era of the old. They were representing the law, and they were looking forward to something great, and it's only really at the end of their lives, even though it was the fulfillment of their lives, that they were coming to the close of their time, even in the earliest part of the New Testament. Simeon and Anna are remembered for what happened to them in their old years. And that is something that is encouraging for each of us. And for those of you who happen to be well advanced in years, those of you who are 85, 90, some plus, that God still has work for you. That even though your body might not move the same way, your memory might not be what it once was decades ago, that God still works through you and God still has purposes for you. And we are encouraged by that. I mean, think of Simeon and Anna. If they had died just a year before, we wouldn't remember anything about them. The entire summary of their lives is remembered by what happened to them at the very end of their earthly existences. And so the biggest thing in your life, if you're 98 years old, may still be a year or two away in its coming. Even if you are in the nursing home, even if you cannot get out of your chair, even if you need help with many of your basic routines of the day, God may still have something grand for you. Because life isn't just lived in reflecting in the past. That, yes, a lot of times as you get older, your memories of the present just don't stick the same way that the old things stay with you. That God still has many things for you. And you can live a long life and still serve God in many ways. It's a privilege in many ways to make it to 100 or some years old because that's so many more days that you had than most people to pray. It's so many more days than many other people had to send cards and encourage people or to send in an offering once in a while. A long life, even if it's not necessarily what we would consider the best, quote-unquote, quality of life, 
is still a life of service to the king, just like it was for Simeon and Anna. You can live a long life and still serve God in powerful ways through the power of prayer. Or you can live a long life and waste the entire thing as well. We think of Hugh Hefner, who lived to be 91 years old, wasted his entire life. You can live a short life, and it can be a life that is very honoring to God. We think of the Christmas story once again when we remember the infants at Bethlehem. Now, of course, they didn't do anything of their own power, but all those baby boys born who were two years old and younger died for the sake of Christ. And so they are remembered, not by name, not by what they did, but they still are honored for having suffered for Jesus' sake. You don't have to have a long life to honor God. You don't have to have a short life to honor God. You can live to middle age and honor God as well. We think of this season and how it comes and it goes, and here we are now on the tail end of the Christmas season. Epiphany coming quickly upon us. The new year has dawned, and we remember that Jesus Christ's birth, as we celebrate December 25th, is not the end of the Christmas story because this, the story carries on, as we heard in the scriptures, right after that part that we read on Christmas Eve, then it goes to Jesus' name being received, the name of Jesus and his circumcision, and then into this uh, story of Simeon and Anna beholding him. And as you think about it, it's not, there are so many important parts of the Christmas story. You know, we tend to think of, we compress it all into just, you know, the, the manger and Bethlehem and the angels. But this part of Simeon and Anna is in the same chapter, Luke chapter 2. And so just because something is famous doesn't mean that it's important. We all know plenty of celebrities who are not worth our time whatsoever to pay attention to, and yet the world fawns after them. It doesn't tend to remember them for the long term, but it remembers them, pays a lot of attention in the short term. But there are things that do not receive a lot of attention in this world that are very important. And the story of Simeon and Anna is certainly one of those accounts. You know, I would say that still most people in our country, even though our country is becoming more secular all the time, that I think if you really push it, most people would remember eventually that Christmas is about the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, most people would probably say the reindeer and Santa Claus and the presents and all those kinds of things. But I think most people in our nation at least still would, would remember, in a, you know, at least if it was a secondary response, that, oh yeah, December 25th is about Jesus too. But I don't think there would be too many who recall the second part of Luke chapter 2. I don't think too many people know about Simeon and Anna. And there are reasons for that. Many, one of the reasons is that this portion of Luke chapter 2 is read on the Sundays following Christmas when the attendance at church is not as large. But it doesn't seem to have the same flash and flare of the angels. It doesn't have the gift-giving part of it. And so people don't pay attention to it. But just because it's not paid attention to does not mean that it is any less important. Because think of the beautiful words here that Simeon spoke. Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared before the face of all people. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Those are beautiful words. They are set aside in your Bible. When you're reading them, they are enclosed like songs or poetry because they are special words. They are just as beautiful as Mary's Magnificat. You know, when she finds out that she's going to give birth, to the baby Jesus, and she says, My soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Simeon and Anna's words are just as important as those words. Or even when Jesus was born, and the angels came to the shepherds, glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to whom his favor rests. See, these are the songs of Christmas. These are the original carols of Christmas, the original words set to music and poetry. But yet, we forget these things. Not many people know Simeon and Anna's song. And so it's important for us that we remember them as part of the Christmas story because what Simeon said was important because Simeon said that he shall cause the rising and the falling of many. Simeon is modestly remembered at this time of the year. But the cute little baby born in a manger will come again. And these words will come in their full force. Because Simeon said it will be for the falling and the rising of many in Jerusalem. And we remember that there's not only one Advent season, not just uh, lighting the candles and counting down the days till Jesus' birth, but there will be a second Advent as well. 
when Jesus Christ shall come at the end of days with the sound of the trumpet and with the company of his angels. And this will not just be some cute story. This will be a story of hope for those who have been waiting, for those of you who have been expecting your Lord like Simeon and Anna waiting years and years and decades and decades. This will be the greatest thing that has ever happened to you. All your dreams, all your hopes will finally be realized in sight. And what a glory that will be. And for those who are in the grave, they shall be raised, as the scriptures tell us. But for those who did not pay attention to the Lord's first coming, will shudder at the Lord's second coming. It will not be good news. It will be a day of great regret. It will be a day of falling. And just like Mary, that a sword shall pierce your soul too, it shall be a day of great pain for you who have not paid attention and trusted in Christ to be your Savior and Lord. So as you reflect upon your mortality this morning, as you reflect upon eternity, you can relate, for most of you, I imagine, to many parts of this story. You who are here today and who trust in Christ as your Savior, you understand the joy that Simeon and Anna had. Even if you're not that old, you can rejoice in knowing that how wonderful it was to see Jesus and how wonderful it will be for you at the end of days to see Jesus in person. But many of you can relate to this story on in a deeper sense because you can relate to Simeon and Anna because you are old, because you're nearing that century mark, because the aches and pains really have caught up with you when you wake up in the morning and your memory may not be as sharp. So those of you who are well advanced in years know the joy that there is in waiting for the Lord. When everything else is taken away from you, when you can't see the same way anymore, when you can't hear anything anymore, nobody can take away Christ from you. Just as we said during this season of uh, Christmas and Advent this year, in 2020 into 2021, they can take away our family get-togethers and you know all the other things that we normally enjoy at this time of year, uh, work parties with friends or gatherings of Christmas choir concerts or whatever. All that can be taken away. But the joy of Jesus in your heart is cannot be taken from you, no matter what age. Now, maybe you're not old, and maybe you're not un- young either. Maybe you're in your middle ages. You can relate to this story as well. You can relate to Simeon. Maybe you can't relate to Simeon, the New Testament figure as much, but you can relate to the Old Testament Simeon. Perhaps in your younger years, your experience was more like Simeon or his brother Levi in the Old Testament. Maybe you've been so angry about something that you've done in your life that you went out and beat somebody else up, and you've been harboring that anger in your life for years. Maybe you even, those of you who are listening or whoever, maybe you have even committed homicide, and you're listening to this sermon today from a prison cell. Maybe you can relate to Dinah, their sister, who was sexually assaulted. Maybe that happened in your life. Maybe there has been depression and bitterness in your existence all these years. Maybe you are like Joseph and were betrayed by your brothers, taken away from your family. Life is complicated. The most important things in life are not the things that we strive for most of the time. We strive for wealth and we strive for fame, as the world does. But the good news is that there is something much greater that comes to you at any age, young or old, that Christ and his forgiveness and his salvation are the greatest thing. And we focus particularly this morning on his forgiveness because Jesus Christ forgives sinners. And that is the good news of the gospel, that whether you have murdered somebody or not, whether you have been sexually assaulted or not, that Jesus Christ can turn the most terrible things in your life and make something good out of them. That is the good news of the gospel that Jesus Christ can take your pain and can turn it into something wonderful. We think of Jesus' mother Mary. A sword shall pierce your own soul too. Who wants to see their child die? But what do we say about Mary? The one, you know, as, as Elizabeth said to Mary as she came to visit her, you know, hail Mary. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. That she is so honored to have the privilege of being the mother of our Lord. Jesus did not come to affirm us in our good deeds and in our righteousness. When Jesus came, he didn't come to say to Simeon, good job. 
I mean, yes, our Lord will say, well done, faithful servant. But that's not the ultimate thing that you're going to hear, even if you have led a, a life that has been of service. That Simeon didn't rejoice and saying, oh, now I've been recognized for what a pious soul I was. He didn't say, finally, uh, somebody is recognizing me that uh, I was waiting for this Christ child for so long, and here's now the proof that what I waited for was worth it. No, it says that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for the Redeemer. He was waiting for somebody to come to save him too because he also was a sinner. And the same with Anna. You know, we, we get the sense that Anna was a very pious woman living at the temple. I mean, she was almost like a nun, having been widowed for many years, single, and being at the temple praying and fasting day and night. But the baby Jesus didn't come to affirm her sense of holiness either. Because when she went and told everybody about this child, she told them that he was the Redeemer. That's what our scripture reading tells us. That She talked about him as the Redeemer. And to be redeemed means to be bought back from something. To be redeemed from something means that there was something that needed to be taken in, something needed to be improved upon. And so she was glad to see her Redeemer. And so may the newborn, yet eternal Christ the King, may he be to your rising and not to your falling today and tomorrow and for the end of the days when he shall come to judge the living and the dead.